Welcome to Fragmented, a software developer podcast where we talk about building good software and becoming better developers. My name's Don Felker. And I'm Kaushik Gopal. Welcome to the show. Greetings, folks. I am excited, as usual, today because I'm actually going to be talking about a library that I use on a daily basis at Instacart. So this is exciting to me. And more importantly, we have the creator of this library uh, with us today. So I'm doubly excited. Anvil is a tool that helps make dependency injection through Dagger uh, much more easy to use, I would say. And today I have the great honor and pleasure to talk to Ralph uh, Wondercheck, and he created Anvil. And I am really happy because both I and you, listener, get to learn from him and learn about the tool and potentially use it in your apps. So without further ado, please welcome Ralph. How's it going, Ralph? Hi, Kaushik. Thank you so much for having me. This is an absolute pleasure. I've been wanting to do this for quite some time because... uh, uh, like I was telling you in the pre-show, we have actually been using, using Anvil for some time. So it's it's nice to like finally meet you and like you know if, uh, clarify some of the understandings and learn more uh, context about the library. So I'm really excited about today. It sounds wonderful. <laughs> I'm happy <laughs> to hear that you're a happy user of Anvil. Can you take a few moments and just talk to us a little about yeah uh, what you do, where you work, how did you get into Android development, just to like get a better picture. Of course. Um, so I'm a technical lead manager at Square. I'm at Square for about uh, a little over two years now. Um, I still have plenty of time to do IC work. And um, that's also when I had the opportunity to work uh, at Anvil. Um, before I joined Square, I was the technical lead at Evernote, which is note taking mm. app. And I started with Android about 10 years ago now, uh, in 2011. I, I was a student. I didn't have much money developing. For Android, it was free. I knew Java. So uh, it was easier to get started with Android than iOS, for example. Yeah, that's how I got into Android. And I still love it today. You mentioned IC work. And for those who don't exactly know that it's individual contributor work, uh, a common term that most folks use is like, you know, there's like management and there's IC work. So you can split your time. So did you like actually work on Anvil as you were like the uh, tech lead? Like, that's crazy. Like, how did you manage to do that? No, that I actually uh, switched into the new role uh, a few months back. That ah. was after I finished Anvil. I started as an IC at Square and yeah, Square has this uh, nice opportunity to give the um, management path a try and uh, start with a small team and then grow uh, as you grow in the role. Um, yeah, and that's, uh, I took this opportunity and now I switched into this position. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I know Square is like a ginormous organization at this point. So what team do you work on in Square? We call ourselves the developer empowerment team. It's a large organization almost now with many sub teams. And there specifically, I'm leading the isolated development team uh, on the Android side. Um, Isolated development or some uh, other companies um, call it sandboxing or um, yeah, or uh, basically feature development. The idea is that you, with a large app, it's cumbersome to install and deploy the app over and over again. And it's a very slow process. And the idea of isolated development is that you pick any feature out of the app, you put it in a tiny sample application, basically, or we call them development apps. And then you iterate much faster on this feature. We are also going that far that you um, write UI tests for this feature for in the sandbox app because they are much smaller. You can deploy them faster. They run faster and they're also less flaky because no other feature can interfere. Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. And I imagine, yeah. And the big intention behind doing this is just to improve like development time. So like people can work on features faster without, without getting bogged down by the size of the app, I presume. Exactly. Uh, like I said, the, the org is called Developer Empowerment. And we we see other Square engineers as our customers. So we 
And we do a variety of things. For example, the organization is also responsible for the CI infrastructure, for uh, other frameworks. Uh, and we, we we try to help other feature developers um, yeah, to, to implement their ideas and functions faster. Dagger has had a long history with Android developers. It is obviously the dependency injection library of choice. Uh, Dagger 2 obviously is like currently like the most uh, popular like tool of choice for most folks. I was curious, I'm sure you use Dagger 2. Everyone uses Dagger 2. It's it's kind of a pain. Dagger in general, you know, it's like an agreed thing where like it tends to get a little complex if you don't understand the innards. But how did Anvil come about? Like, why did you even feel the need to build something like Anvil? Like, where did that come from? Because I imagine one day you woke up and felt, oh, my God, this X is really difficult with Dagger. And, you know, I wish I could make it easy. And therefore, you know, after a few, like, uh, iterations, you landed up with Anvil. So what was that X? Like, you know, what is, uh, if you can fill in that blank about what made you sort of like want to build something like Anvil? I'm glad that I mentioned development apps because that was the main reason we started Anvil. Um, we have a large code base. We have um, a couple of products in our code base that we ship, like applications. We have a point of sale application. We have an appointments application that we ship in the Play Store. When we we when we started working on development apps, um, Dega was one of the harder things to solve for us. Um, we want to have a common setup for all of our applications. So it's um, so that you can switch between different modules faster and you're kind of familiar and you don't have to learn new patterns from scratch. Um, but this uh, Dagger, like you said, Dagger is uh, powerful, but can be difficult to work with. And we try to bring structure into our Dagger setup. And um, nonetheless, every time you try to set up a new development app, it was difficult or took, I should say rather, uh, took a lot of time to um, make Dagger compile, make Dagger happy and provide all dependencies. And that's then where um, Envil came in. Um, I, I should say, I think to better understand why we started Envil and how this works with development apps, I should explain a little bit how we structure our code, how we set up our modules. Um, so when you create a library in our code base, you usually create three modules. Uh, we have a public module, which describes the API, what this library is doing. You have an implementation module, which then implements all the interfaces. And then we have a wiring module, which where in which we write all the Dagger modules. And the Dagger modules basically say, if you want to inject this uh, specific interface type, then you should use this concrete implementation. Basically, we bind this specific implementation module to its public API. And uh, that, that's the, the main part. So we basically uh, bake dependency inversion, the, the design pattern into our module structure, which says that you should not depend on implementation details and only um, depend on public types and information that are shared. That's fascinating. I, I had some follow-up questions, if you don't mind on that. Of course. Uh, first, so when you say like, you know, if, if anytime you create a new library, so, you know, I'm just thinking in pure like Android terms. Mm -hmm. So it, would each feature then be built like in a separate module? So if I think about a multi-module app, you're saying you would have a new module called library or feature or whatever it is. And in those, you would have three packages or something with public implementation construction. Or are you saying you would have three independent modules that you would then like combine together like a unit? Yeah, uh, it it is that you would have three separate Gradle modules uh, oh. in the subdirectory. Yes. And it's often also the case that you have more than three uh, modules because right, right. The, there's always only one API, but you can have different implementations. For example, um, with our products, um, we the appointments application might want to use a different implementation than one of the other applications. And in regards to development apps, it's often that development apps want to use a fake implementation if they have a dependency on another feature. With this approach, we reduce the dependency graph and those development applications build a lot faster compared to our main applications. 
Oh, interesting. So that was my uh, going to be my other question because it does seem like that's a lot of like overhead slash boilerplate to begin with. Uh, so I was going to say like what what was the reason? Like why there obviously must be a good reason why you're doing it. So you mentioned like development times actually end up being faster, and I presume this is because you're wiring it up in such a way that the dependencies usually you, you don't land up with Gradle like just recompiling the whole thing because everything is just so tightly linked. Uh, adding clear separations makes sure that the dependencies are clean so if you're changing one bit it doesn't have to, it doesn't re-trigger an entire like compilation is that the idea behind it um the the main reason why we have to set up is that we and i agree with you saying that it is a lot of overhead but we have a very large code base and uh, many lines of code in there and we um it wasn't feasible anymore for feature development to use the main applications. When you have build times, even if it's just three minutes, it's way too long. Sometimes you want to change a simple string or a change of function Boolean, and then you don't want to wait three minutes until you see the result on your screen. Right, right, right. It should be, it should be faster than this. And um, the, the, the idea, the solution to this for us was uh, isolated development. And then the question was, how can we able uh, isolated features? And this was by enforcing this uh, dependency version pattern in our module structure, where you can only depend on those public APIs and never on any specific implementation. And this then allows development apps to replace many of the larger dependencies with with no op implementations, basically. Oh, in order to do the so, actually, I'll come back to that in a second. But so, the primary goal you're saying with like structuring your app this way was mostly to make sure that uh, it was like mostly development time. That was like the primary goal, yes. and yeah, mostly development time. So to do this, did you did you create like do you have like helper scripts? Do you have like another library that does this for you? Because I imagine every time you create a feature you know, three separate Gradle modules with like separate build our Gradle files and doing all that sounds again tricky. So do you use like Android Studio templates, IntelliJ templates, that kind of stuff? Or do you use like utility scripts to run it? How do you go about like, what does creating it actually look like? At the moment, it's literally uh, two clicks to create a new library with that many modules. We, uh, we started uh, with a small script that generates all the boilerplate if you want to create a new library. But now we have a full-fledged uh, IntelliJ plugin oh, nice. that we use uh, with a nice UI where you can select which modules you want to generate. And uh, this library generator also then generates some boilerplate or sample code so that it's easier for develop developers to get started and understand where they are allowed to or where they should place their code. And then um, on top of this, we also have checks in CI so that nobody, for example, depends on an implementation module in another implementation module. So it's not allowed to hard code any dependencies. Ah, that's interesting. So that was the other thing I was going to ask because you said in between when you were explaining it, you wanted to, you wanted to ensure that the implementation only like relies on like I think you mentioned like public or it isn't exposed. So. My question was like, oh, how do you run those checks? And I'm a, so like you have CI checks that make sure that you don't accidentally like contaminate that uh, sort of exactly. uh, exposure. That's pretty cool. Exactly. Any chance you guys are going to open source this stuff or no? Is it like still pretty like tightly linked to the way Square like functions? Um, that's a good question. Um, we didn't see the need to open source it. It's actually not that that much that would be open sourced. I, I gave hmm. a talk about this topic, how we structure the code. And it's, I think it's more important to understand the concept. And, and then you have to weigh in how important certain patterns are for your code base and your product. Again, we have a large code base with different products that we ship. And that might not be necessary for every other company out there. It's uh, for smaller uh, code bases, this might be over-engineered and I would not recommend using it. But for us, we, we have this in place now for almost two years. Uh, it has proven to be very successful. Nice, nice. And you would say like the developers working on this like are pretty happy, especially given the compile times are probably not as bad? Yes, they, they are happy. Uh, the feedback was 
mostly positive and um yeah th there's always room for improvement i oh, should say yeah. <laughs> uh, but yes it's definitely better to work this way for most developers developers are kind of like difficult to keep happy right <laughs> you can always keep making things better <laughs> <laughs> yes yes there are also downsides uh, to this approach like uh, we run into bottlenecks in the ide the ide struggles sometimes to load that many modules and we're working also with uh, google and JetBrains to improve the situation but uh so there there is an investment that we made and but we are still very happy with the solution Stepping back into like, uh, oh, by the way, uh, I will make sure to add your talk in our show notes uh, because I, I briefly went through that talk because I think you refer to it somewhere in the Anvil code base as well. So uh, I, I'll definitely make sure that I add a link to that talk. Uh, stepping back into Anvil. So th so this is like the, you're setting the background stage, which makes sense. So obviously there's, what I understand from this is there's, if I was using Dagger 2, there's going to be like, a mountain of dependencies between like these different modules uh, and so that's where you started to think about this how how did that story progress from there yes when uh, i'm glad that you asked about how we create modules so we when we again started with isolated development we saw all those problems like it's cumbersome to create a new library so we wrote this plugin for IntelliJ that generates all the code for developers so that it's a few clicks. So we try to speed up each developer flow. And one of the last annoying pieces of creating a new development app for us was um, assembling all the Dagger modules that you need for your development app. And the process uh, is similar like this. So you would create a new development app with our library generator. It generates all the boilerplate for you. It generates the Dagger components, for mm -hmm. example. But what you still need to do is you need uh, you need to add dependencies to all the features that you want to bring in in your development app. And then you have once you've done this, then you have to reload the IDE so that it picks up all those dependencies from your build.gradle files. And then you need to add the Dagger modules to the components to the Dagger components in your development app. And this felt like you have to do this step twice. First, you have to add the dependency uh, to the wiring module, and then you actually have to import the Dagger module in the Kotlin code. Mm -hmm. And th th this process was very tedious. It's, it sounds like, well, it's fine. You, I mean, you spend a few more minutes and uh, it's okay, but uh, at the same time at this uh, one and a half years ago were very bad. So you try to avoid syncing in the IDE frequently. And the um, the other thing is that it was in the end boilerplate uh, to write the list of modules that your bigger component should include. And we wanted to make um, the process easier. And the idea was, well, if I if my development app knows which other libraries I bring in, which other wiring modules I import, um, then the development app should also know which Dagger modules include. I mean, if I import a specific wiring module, then it's I only import it to bring in the Dagger module for my dependency graph. And that's that's where the, the idea of Envil started. Can we skip the second part where you need to add this... Um, or explicitly need to include the Dagger module in your component. Shouldn't it be enough to say in your builder Gradle file to, uh, to import the wiring module? Right. I'm going. I'm going to like maybe like step in a little like back because now for folks, most people at this point, you know what how Dagger functions. But you know, I'm just going to try to like. I mean, this is like an impossible task, but I'm going to try to like uh, give a primer on Dagger. Uh, just so we can understand like the complexity because you mentioned one thing which was interesting to me which is you know it doesn't seem like it's that much more difficult like you know it's a few minutes of work but to that point it, yes if you're starting new but i can only imagine if, if you have like a hundred modules and you have different dependencies crisscrossing here and there when, when you run into a problem is when you would hope something like animal exists not when you're starting out i would say right yes but even before that like maybe just stepping back a little so and uh, okay, so I'm I'm gonna run with this. I'll give you a two minutes out of primer. Can you please like make sure I'm saying the right things and correct me if you know I'm going something wrong with my dagger knowledge? 
typically Dagger has like these two big constructs called components and modules. And the simplest way to put it is, because I mean, in the early Dagger one was a little different. The whole concept of components was like a little different, but well, let's forget all of that. We're only talking about Dagger 2 now. Dagger 1 is a thing of the past. So all the stuff that we're talking about here is mostly Dagger 2. In Dagger 2, we have uh, the concept. So if you think about what Dagger is, Dagger is a dependency injection library, which means if you ever need like a service object and you need to use it somewhere in your activity or your fragment or like at your uh, consumption point, you need, you just call at inject and magically from the graph that Dagger creates, you get this dependency. So that's like the overall idea of Dagger. And in Dagger, there are very two, uh, there are two important constructs. One is called modules and the other is components. Modules is where you actually create the service. So say I want network service or retrofit service or something. You pro, you actually add that inside the module and the module is the thing that's uh, in charge of constructing that object. Say I need this retrofit service, add this endpoint, whatever, customize, do something there. That's what exists in the module. But you can't access modules directly from your activities or fragments. You need to interface with that graph. So like if you think about the graph as being a bunch of modules, your view into Dagger is through components. So components is almost like a wrapper class. That's a very shallow way of putting it. But you call into these modules that give you the service objects via the components. So that's the primer on Dagger. Uh, now stepping into what, yeah, uh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Uh, did I like miss anything or like, you know, did I? No, you, you explained this. You explained this very well, in my opinion. Uh, the only thing I would like to add is that for modules, yes, they create objects, like you say, they provide. the And the other concept is that they do is you can say, if I want to inject a certain type, like my login handler, um, which is an interface, an abstract type, the modules can also say, if you inject this type, then use this concrete implementation. And Dagger is responsible for creating this object as long as it has an inject constructor. Ah, got it, got it. Okay, so that makes sense. So like say, because you could have, uh, I don't know, login handler one, login handler two, login handler three is concrete implementations of your login interface, but that module is what tells you, okay, in the context of this part of the app that uses this module and component, bring in login handler one or two, depending on that. That's where That's what happens in the module. Exactly, yes. Got it, okay. So now I want to go back to what you said. Uh, the problem currently with Dagger, if you in in a in a world where we did not have Anvil, you said there's like two things like you have to run through this step twice. So the way to connect components and modules first is you have an at component annotation on the class that's called the component. You have to the step one is basically you have to because you can only talk to a module through a component. You have access to the component. So in that component. I, if I remember it, like, you know, you add dependencies and then you point to the exact module name that uh, you have, right? So that's step one. And step two is inside that component itself, you need to like, pro like the component interface, like you have to expose those methods. So that's, a that's I don't think that's the same as the step two that uh, you were talking about, but can you like help understand? So, okay, now that I know what a component and a module is, what are the two steps uh, that you have to do previously uh, without an anvil yep. setup? Uh, sure. So let's say you have your component, like you said, and you want to inject a specific type in your activity or fragment. Usually in an activity, uh, you use field injection where you create a field, for example, your login handler. Um, when you and Then you tell Dagger, I would like to use this component to inject my login handler into this activity. Um, the, when you then try to build your application and Dagger processes all the information, um, it would tell you that you need to provide a login handler because it does know what it is. Um, it only knows you try to inject this type, and but it doesn't know how uh, to fulfill this contract. And that's where modules come in. Then, then you tell if you tell you tell Dagger for this component, please include this module. For example, in your login handler module. And the login handler module says if you ask for a login handler, you get login handler one, this specific implementation. Um, then you add this module to your component annotation 
uh, for the component interface. And the next time you try to build your application, Dagger runs and you still want to inject login handler, but then Dagger inspects all the modules that you included in your component. And then it sees, oh, I know this time how to fulfill the contract for login handler. I should provide this login handler one implementation. And when you inject login handler, you get this specific implementation without actually knowing that it's this specific uh, implementation type. Um, that's basic. So the modules tell Dagger um, if you ask for a specific type, which concrete implementation you should use. And that's also where many people get frustrated, in my opinion, because those error messages are often uh, confusing and you're uh, sometimes uh, also hard to dig through. And that's also um, what we've seen with development apps. So when you start with a brand new development app, and you inject so many different types, you, you assume a larger dependency graph, but you didn't add any modules yet, you get 50, 60, 70 missing dependencies and the error message is so long and it's so difficult to work through and you, then you start uh, looking at each individual error one by one and you have to simply work through it. And that's where it's cumbersome um, to set up a new application um, that should use Dagger dependency injection that aspect that you said it's funny because i'm sure anyone who's worked with dagger has run through that where just going through the error messages especially you know dagger 2 is much better with this i would say where it, like the errors like start to make more sense uh than at least in dagger 1 but oh my god yeah that's like the most frustrating aspect you're like oh my god the component and you know, depending on like the time of the day and the amount of coffee that you've had, you just at some point, you just go crazy and start throwing in every module and every component in there, right? Uh, I mean, I've definitely been there where sometimes I'm like, I just want this thing to work. Damn it. Like dagger, just take, make it work. So just throw in any module and component. Uh, so yeah, the, the frustration is real there. Okay. So like, so we understand like the pain points with, uh, dagger per se. How does Anvil help? with this uh, there are a couple of like follow-up items as well in terms of just like how anvil was built and like you know how did you like land up or what is it yeah how how did you like land up writing it but since we're on the path of like understanding like the pain point and how anvil helps maybe let's like spend some time there yeah so um i'd like to get back to the step where Dega throws you or shows you all those weird error matches <laughs> Error message that says a certain type is missing or a binding is missing. Um, what what we've seen developers then do for the applications is they add the dependency to the library, which includes the specific Dagger module, which fulfills this contract and provides a specific type uh, or implementation for a type that you try to inject. So then again, you have to load. Uh, reload or sync the, your application in Android Studio, which is slow. And after this, you can add this Dagger module to your component. And the next time you build, uh, Dagger is happy. We try to improve this process where you basically only need to add the dependency in your build Gradle file. After this, you don't need to sync in Android Studio and you don't need to specifically add this Dagger module to your component. And that's where Envil comes in, and it's our solution. What Envil does in the end is it tells Dagger uh, to automatically include all the modules that are part of your compilation or your compile class path. So as soon as you bring in a dependency in your build file, then it's usually on your compile class path. And then uh, Envil generates all the code uh, to include the Dagger modules automatically for you. Which sounds like a small step and only a little improvement, but at a at a certain scale, it quickly adds up. Oh, for sure. So basically, say you have a module that has, uh, sorry, say you have a Gradle module where you have, you know, a component and you have like 60, 50 to 60 modules. And, you know, in a moderately large app, that's very common, right? You could have as easy as 50 modules adding each of those 50 modules into your component and then making sure that you add like the component interface methods that can be pretty tedious. So you're saying what Anvil does is if it notices that it's in the same compile path, 
it just basically automatically adds it uh what if there's stuff that you don't want to add right like how how is that handled if that makes sense that that's a good question so the, it's easy to it's once anvil um collects all those modules and generates the list of modules that should be included in the dagger component uh, it it's easy to run into duplicate bindings. That's the other weird error that that Dagger sometimes throws. Oh God, I I hate that. I hate that error. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So it, it it basically means you try to inject one type like login handler, but you tell Dagger, oh, login handler could be implementation one or implementation two, and you need to be explicit and decide which one to use uh, by excluding one specific type. We've seen in our code base, that is, by now it rarely happens because we have this granular module structure with uh, implementation modules, with wiring modules, which only include the dagger modules. Um, for us, it usually means that you simply remove a dependency on the wiring module and suddenly and uh, automatically this duplicate binding is gone. Interesting. So basically, we... we we uh, create our dependency or yeah, our object graph, our dependency graph for Dagger in our builder Gradle files. Like what exactly, can you like help explain that? Like usually that isn't the case with Dagger, right? So it isn't created at that level. What happens like with the regular Dagger and how is this different, if that makes sense? Um, so again, going back to the step for your application, you add certain dependencies in your, uh, to other library modules in your builder Gradle file. And then, you have to do the same step again in your dagger component. Now it can happen that you don't need a certain dependency anymore. What you do is you remove the dagger module and it's then not in your dependency graph anymore. And if you don't inject the type, then dagger won't complain. But now it also happens that you still have this dependency in your builder Gradle file, which means your application is larger than it needs to be. It, when you run it, it needs, uh, Gradle needs to build more code than which which is unnecessary. So what we are doing by using Anvil, we basically decide what to include in the Dagger dependency graph uh, by adding dependencies in our in our module in our uh, builder Gradle file. So we can easily remove a dependency or add a dependency, then compile our applications, and maybe Dagger complains that you have a missing binding or you have a duplicate binding, but it's easily fixed by removing or adding a dependency in the builder Gradle file. This is starting to make more sense. And again, I know that there's a difference between Anvil is like, a, if I understand right, it's a Kotlin compiler plugin. And I think that's the difference between it being a pure like annotation processing mechanism versus being a compiler plugin, right? Or is that like a different aspect? That's a different aspect. Um, it's, that's that's more like an implementation detail of the idea of automatically assembling the list of modules that Dagger should include. Um, you could take different approaches. You could also um, probably use a, a bytecode writer, and it's there. There there are different options on the table. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Going back to Anvil, so like. Well, what do I do? Like, should I just add Anvil as like a dependency in the Gradle file and magically it just takes care? Like, no, right? Like I have to, it, at the components in the module level, I got to do something where I'm pointing to the module or the component. Like how, how does, like, how do you think through that approach with Anvil? Yeah. Um, what we tried with Anvil was to make this setup fairly uh, easy. So like you said, usually the first step would be if you want to adopt Anvil is um, adding the Anvil Gradle plugin to your module where you want to use Anvil, and it automatically adds the dependencies. And like you said, it's written as a compiler plugin for Kotlin. So it takes the Gradle plugin takes care of all of this. You just add a, uh, you just apply the Gradle plugin. Um, and then in your code, you usually change the add component annotation from Dagger to an add merge component. Everything else is, stays the same. You actually, by this point, you don't need to uh, change anything. You still can manually include modules, and uh, everything should work. But that, that's the initial step. And at this point, then you can start using Anvil in your library modules for your Dagger modules. And the way 
and the, makes the connection between a dagger component and which modules to include is by saying, by adding a new annotation to your module where you say this module is contributed to a specific scope. For example, your application scope or your singleton scope. That um, oh, this is interesting. A quick follow-up. So Dagger already has scopes, right? Is this different from that, or is like uh, the, in, in in concept, is it the same thing? Or yeah, because you know, like with Dagger, you have singleton scope. You have uh, and a common thing that most people use is like activity scope. Uh, how similar or different is this to that? Technically. Um, scopes in Envil are different, but we share the same scopes. Uh, you could have different scopes for Envil and different scopes for Dega, but it's, it sounds confusing. It would be very confusing and very hard to maintain. So we, we in our applications, we have an application scope, which refers to the singleton scope. On top of that, we have a locked in scope and then also the activity scope, like you said. And we have shared the same scopes with Envil and a scope. In regards to Envil, it's it's really just a class, uh, a, a type, and um, where you say um, when you would type this, you would say this module contributes to, and then we use the application application scope class and reference it in the annotation, and that's all Envil needs to understand for scopes. It's just um, like a path. Uh, it makes so in order to make the connection between the component and the module. And then when Dagger, or when Envy actually creates this list of modules for Dagger, uh, it, and you say this is a component for, or this is the application component, then Envy looks for all modules that should be included in the application scope. And then it adds all these modules to this component. Got it. So that makes sense. So the, it's almost, and music stepping back to like that primary video on Dagger. So if you think about, uh, needing a component, which depends on modules. So you have modules and then you also have the component interface. What makes it easy now is you can literally just, so the thing that glues all of these together is that scope, right? So that scope, uh, the contributes to is what you add at the leaf nodes, uh, so to speak. And when you say merge component, you provide in that same scope. So if you think of the component as like, you know, the point of interaction, that's like the, you know, the way you're crossing the boundary between like your application and into the graph. That's where you like merge the component and say, this is the scope for that component. And in all of your like uh, leaf nodes, so like in the modules and in the interfaces that you need to expose, you basically just point to that scope. So that scope thing is what glues all of this together. Exactly. Like similar to a no when you normally work with Dagger, where you do the setup of your components once, um, it is similar with Anvil, where you say uh, you use the merge component once for your component interface that your Dagger component is, and then usually you work with the contributes to annotation, which you then add, like you said, to your Dagger modules and um, your, I think Dagger calls them entry point interfaces. Yes. Right, right. So, uh, and you you actually like uh, answered a question that I usually like to ask as well. So, you know, if I'm fresh, I'm starting with the Dagger 2 and I hear like Ralph created this thing called Anvil. It makes my Dagger life easy. So I'm going to start using it in an app. Uh, what are the steps? So you, you said a good thing. So just think of it as like regular Dagger. You just use it. But in your component, you add like merge component with a scope. And then in my modules and my interface, all I have to do is just work with the contributes to annotation and then it all just gets magically wired up and in the example you've shown like you know app scope is like the most common thing so you yeah like in all these like you can just just stacking on that app scope it's it's hard to explain in words but like yeah it's almost like magical because you can just throw in that scope contributes to and then like dagger just figures it all out yes exactly and we we try to limit the api surface for and the it I, we really hope that when you start using Envil, you, you won't start from scratch and have to learn a new DI framework. It's, Envil is really not a DI uh, dependency injection framework. It's really just a small companion for Dagger, and, but it Im implements an important concept for us that uh, Dagger was lacking. The big problem, um, anyone who works on like an app that's no longer like a small app, right? Like if you work in a team of like at least three to four teams, inevitably your app is going to be like modularized, 
right? And this is the Gradle modularize that we we're talking about. And it looks mm-hmm. obvious that you guys are doing this too at Square. Um, but you know, simplistically, like the way most uh, the mo- the way most teams basically structure their app is okay. I have a multi module setup. I have like my main module. I have like different things, you know, my main module or core module or whatever you call it. And you have multiple feature modules. So feature one, feature two, feature three. If I were to, how does like, and A, my part one of my question is, how does Anvil deal with like multi-module setups? Uh, You mentioned like in Square using something that's slightly different, but I'm curious, like, you know, in terms of a regular app, if you just had feature modules and a regular module, do I just contribute to app scope and everything just works that's question one and second is what if i didn't want that right because it sounds very similar to a singleton kind of approach where everything's a singleton so part two is like oh that i'm a little worried about that because maybe there are cases where i do not want to expose um if to take a concrete example right say feature one's component contributes to uh, not contributes like you know it's merged into the app scope and feature two is also merged into app scope Technically, that means the dependencies with feature one and feature two are exposed to each other, right? So how do I partition that scope? So that's part two. Uh, do those questions kind of make sense? Um, I'm a little unsure about the second one, but maybe let's start with the first one. Um, how, how to work with Anvil in a multi-module setup. Um, like I said, um, you you need to apply the, in order to set up Anvil for a new library module, like a feature module, what you do is you apply the Cradle plugin uh, in your builder Cradle file, like you apply the Android Cradle plugin, that's no different. And then it, you simply add the contributes to annotation to your Dagger modules. And when your application module then includes this feature module, everything uh, automatic uh, automatically happens under the hood and will will include these modules in your component. Hmm. And in all of these, the contributes to is to app scope. So I'm using a single scope in all of these, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. You can choose a different scope, but yes, uh, for your app. The, there's a, an inversion happening. Usually with Dagger, you, when you create a module, you never make the decision um, where to include this module. You could include this module in the application scope, like you said, or you could also include this module in the activity scope. That would also work. Um, with Envil, it's a little bit different because usually a module implicitly assumes to be included in a certain module. Let's say you have you your module provides a UI element for some reason, <laughs> um, then uh, uh, you you imply that this module is included in the activity scope because you need to have access maybe to the activity. Um, so it's often that Dagger modules uh, implicitly must be included in a certain scope. With Anvil, you make this decision explicit. The, um, by saying that this module should be included in the app scope, for example, or in the activity scope. Um, that's, that is, um, I think, helpful. So because uh, the, the implicit direction now suddenly becomes explicit and obvious and visible in code. Mm. I guess like that makes sense, but my only, I think where I'm missing something is, like, you know, maybe that's the second part of like the question. Um, See, like, so it's starting off in my like feature module, right? Do I, so are you saying like in those, we also have contributes to app scope? Like how do the scopes talk to each other? Or is there no question of scope? Like Anvil just automatically includes everything. So you don't have to worry about the scope per se. Does that question like make sense? Because I, I noticed you said something which is good about like changing the direction uh, implicitly versus like, you know, making it explicit. But I'm trying to understand that better. Like, I don't know if I actually, it sounds like you said something really important, <laughs> but I'm trying to understand yes. what that is. Oh no, I, it makes that makes sense. So um, you can have different scopes um, or components. It, it goes back to Dego. Anvil actually doesn't make a connection between the different scopes. It, this is a normal Dego, and it's no different with Anvil. So if you work with Dego, you can have uh, component dependencies or between components. Um, and it doesn't change this. Or what we use is subcomponents, where um, uh, you, you can basically create a graph of components. And um, in order to to create a subcomponent, you you would add for normal Dagger 
at the at subcomponent annotation instead of the component annotation. And you can um, then in the Envil world, you, you would just switch the add subcomponent to an add merge subcomponent. And you say this would be the activity scope, for example. And so you set up your different uh, different dagger components, uh, components and um, the connection between is normal dagger code where then, for example, your main, uh, your application component would create the subcomponent. And that's no different in the... Got it, got it. So that was the piece that was missing to me because I was like, wait, am I required to add everything to app scope? Like how do components talk to each other? But so like that also like kind of answers my next question, which is in a world where we have different feature modules, you still can like have spe specific scopes to those features, but you just have to like, uh, like as in the case with regular Dagger, you have to establish those dependencies between the components like you would. And I imagine you do that with, yeah, if you have subcomponents, then you have merge subcomponent and you point you point to the dependency, like which scope that you want to merge to eventually. Exactly, exactly, yes. Got it, got it. That, that makes like a lot of sense. Um, I want to step back to something that we talked about previously. Uh, you, so uh, you said Anvil is like a, uh, well, I said that just because I saw that <laughs> in the readme, but Anvil is a Kotlin compiler plugin as against like, you know, it doesn't uh, do annotation processing or like it doesn't have like capped involved. Can you talk about that? Because I have like little knowledge about that aspect. I'm curious. Yeah. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Does that save? Like what performance benefits do I get? Can you like, give us a rundown on that aspect? Sure. So um, when we started with Anvil, I actually explored multiple options. Um, I tested a, a bytecode transformer, for example. First, I I tested a normal annotation processor, and I also tested compiler plugins. Um, com compiler plugins for Kotlin are still new and still experimental, and it was they were even more experimental a year ago, <laughs> and but it, it was very promising to use a Kotlin compiler plugin because compiler plugins allow you to rewrite code that you write in your normal Kotlin files. They, they, they allow you to change and transform code. So it gives you more possibilities than, for example, a normal annotation processor. An annotation processor usually works like this, where you say you, know, you annotate a type or a function or what, um, specific piece of code with an annotation and an annotation processor then generates additional code to that. And then you uh, reference this generated code in your application. Uh, with a compiler plugin, um, you not only can generate new code, but you can change existing code, um, which is very powerful. And Anvil actually makes uh, use of this a little bit. Um, when it, for example, when it comes to um, merging those uh, all, all those contributed dagger modules, uh, we actually uh, add an annotation uh, to existing code which isn't there before, and an annotation processor wouldn't be allowed to do that. Oh, that's pretty cool. So that yeah, that was I think the difference uh, with most like annotation processing, like adding more code versus like rewriting. So a Kotlin compiler plugin in in theory, is actually like similar to like a bit code transformer, like where you can actually swap out the bits, but it probably it is like a registered API that allows you to do it in a clean way, I presume. Exactly. Yes. Um, and the other reason why we decided for a Kotlin compiler plugin is uh, speed. And <laughs> you mentioned this already. Uh, if we would have chosen an annotation processor, then uh, we would have would need to deal with KPT or capped. Um, the, the Kotlin annotation processing tool. And CAPT has overhead. It, it, is, uh, it significantly slows down uh, your compile times or your build times, I should say. And we wanted to avoid this. That's why we also initially looked at the normal bytecode transformer. Um, but again, with a Kotlin compiler plugin, it's not needed. There's also a downside to this choice. Um, we still have a mixed code base of Java and Kotlin. And obviously, it's a, Envil is a Kotlin compiler plugin, but it means that you wouldn't be able to use Envil with Java code. You can mm -hmm. still 
you can still mix Java and Kotlin, but you can only add those annotations uh, or Kotlin code or to Kotlin code, I should say. I had a question though. Uh, so, but it can will still like it just so happens uh, when you say it doesn't work with the like you know uh, Java modules per se. You still can have Java code. That's what you're saying, right? Yes, yes. Uh, you can still have uh, Java code. You can still have Dagger modules in Java, um, but you wouldn't be able to contribute um, with and those Java Dagger modules to your um, uh, to your dependency graph. Instead, you would still need to add those ma those ma modules manually, like you would normally do with Dagger. That's still supported. Okay. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, that makes sense. And for the yeah, for folks who don't, it's like they're one of the beauties and the many pitfalls of daggers. There's multiple ways to do something, right? Like you can, yeah, dagger has like some cool things. I've I I forget. I was having a conversation the other day, but you know, you don't even have to use inject dependencies. You can manually you can get a whole of component and modules and then directly call your dependencies from there, right? Like the inject dependency itself doesn't need to be there. You see so many examples where you see the at inject that people are like so tuned to thinking that that's how Dagger works. But you can play around with the way you. Obviously, there are conventions that are recommended, but Dagger is pretty powerful that way. You can do like some crazy things, right? Yes, we um, and that's actually a problem in a large code base like ours the, that you have so many possibilities because we try to stick to one pattern uh, to make it easier to navigate the code base and to work in it. Um, we when we have this case, for example, with the Java module that we want to use with Anvil, then we usually convert it to Kotlin, and this has actually also another advantage. Um, we we are this certain modules uh, for us they uh, they don't include any Java code at all because we are using a compiler plugin. We for for Anvil we also generate Kotlin code, which means that when you compile and build this mod uh, this Gradle module to be clear this Gradle module, then we only need to compile Kotlin code and there's no Java code and then usually this uh, Gradle module builds faster. So this brings up the time improvements for us. Oh, wow. Yeah. Interesting. So, and the improvement comes in because you only have like one kind of like, you only have Kotlin code to deal with and no Java. Like where does that improvement come in? Because eventually doesn't Kotlin in some ways boil down to generating Java? Um, It boils down to bytecode, not uh, to Java. Can you like draw that distinction out if you don't mind? Yes, sure. Uh, so what what happens is you have your source code and like a normal Java file or a normal Kotlin file. And then when you run the compiler, the compiler transforms this source code into a bytecode. And then later in your tool chain, this bytecode is transformed into DEX code and the DEX code lands in your APK and uh, Android devices then run this DEX code. Actually, there are more steps to this, but this is the TIDR. And you can work, uh, you can mix Kotlin and Java because all, they they are transformed into the same uh, bytecode in the end. And um, this is what's um, deployed in, on your device. Um, so in regards to build times, there's overhead. Well, basically, the more your build tool has to do, the more work it has, uh, the slower your build times become. And we try to remove uh, many steps for building a module. For, um, that one step is, for example, running the Java compiler. But if you don't have any Java code in your module, then you can skip the Java compiler. That's less work to build a module. Therefore, the module builds faster. And the same is true for KPT, uh, for the Kotlin annotation processor. If you don't run any annotation processor, then you can remove uh, the annotation processing tool. That's less work for your build tool for Gradle in the end, and your module then or your Gradle module will build faster. And that actually is a very significant. It lands up being a big difference, especially with capped and annotation processing, right? Yes, um, Anvil actually has a special mode where it can. We we talked about this one feature of contributing modules. There's an extra feature where you can generate factories that or of code that normally the Dagger annotation processor would generate. Um, it used to be an experimental feature, but it's now stable, and we are using it also at Square. What it does is, or, or the, the fundamental problem there is that 
Vega requires KPT, which is slow. Um, it in a large code base that's a significant overhead. And by using Anvil instead of the Vega annotation processor, um, we can often remove uh, KPT from our modules. We start generating Kotlin code, so there's no Java code at all anymore. And by removing those many, or oh, yeah, this many components, uh, our modules, our Gradle modules, build a lot faster. And we've seen single modules building uh, up to 66% faster. Oof, that's yeah, that that makes quite the difference, I suppose. Yeah. Yes, and for. For applications, um, we, on average, we've seen for different build time scenarios, um, we measured that on average they build 16% faster in our entire code base. So that was that was a big win for us, uh, removing KPT and relying on a Kotlin compiler plugin instead. Very nice, very nice. Yeah, that aspect was uh, I was going to ask because I remember in the early days seeing Dagger Factory generation as being experimental, and I was like, I don't know, let's turn it on and see. It says it'll make my builds faster, <laughs> so it's nice to understand, especially now. Like as we, yeah, like you do the distinct difference between Capt and the Java compiler, the Kotlin compiler, Kotlin compiler, and so it's starting to make sense why. Because previously, like my thinking was very different about. Oh, like, how does it matter? Java, Kotlin is the same thing. Like, you know, at least like, you know, both transform down to the same thing, but it makes more sense now because you can avoid one step altogether. Like you don't even need to, like, as you have the Kotlin compiler take care of things, that's taken care of. And now with cap, you're adding one more like additional step that's being removed. So it's, it's nice to understand now, like what that means. Like, you know, you're basically trying to shift work at an earlier stage or avoid it altogether in like, you know, the regular Dagger process, right? Yes, exactly. We try to avoid work and uh, in order to make the build faster. Uh, yes. And it goes back to like what you were saying, right? In the early days, the part of the problem why you did all of this was because you wanted to make build times better, like for that uh, setup that you had. Um, I Almost. Well, I, I like to clarify this. So um, initially, we tried to improve uh, developer efficiency. Actually, uh, if you use Anvil in the normal way without this uh, uh, second mode where you can generate vector factories, then build times will be actually a little bit slower because uh, Anvil is a is a companion to Dekka. It's a convenience to it. Ah, I see. Got it, it got it. Got it. It, it it doesn't improve the times because it's uh, there is extra work uh, that needs to be done, which is and the, the build uh, your build tool uh, or the compiler plugin has to run during compilation. That is an extra step that wasn't there before. Therefore, its um, build times are a little bit slower. We measured about four percent, which was uh, insignificant for us, so we didn't have a problem. Um, rolling it out but then uh, later once we rolled it out and we uh, implemented the second mode where we can avoid kpt and um, uh, the java compiler then uh, suddenly the, uh, the it shifted towards that with anvil our builds are significantly faster and not slower oh that's a good, yeah that's thank thanks for calling that out. that's like a very good distinction between the two process and that makes perfect sense to me now that i understand how the innards you could you could argue the same thing for Dagger that Dagger is a convenience tool uh, you <laughs> wait, wait. in applications you don't need to use the dependency injection framework you could write all this code manually and you um it would still work um Dagger just generates all the boilerplate and with Anvil it's similar it it replaces some of the patterns that feel like boilerplate with Dagger and it generates the code uh, for these patterns and therefore um yeah the generation step makes it a little bit slower right no that makes perfect sense uh to like you know dagger in itself is a convenience tool but it does yeah hey actually i would suggest that to listeners too if you haven't tried it you should try to like write an app without any dependency injection without uh Oh, well, I should say without dependency injection, without Dagger as your choice of dependency injection. See how you do it, you know, uh, like vanilla DI, which is, you know, make use of like your app uh, at the app level. You start to store like dependencies and injectors and that like starts to like pass it down in each activity as you get access. It's a very, it, it's sort of, I think like, you know, for people who don't understand 
because a lot of Android developers like jump into repositories that already have Dagger. So there's all, it's a fair question. You know, like, why would I bother doing like this thing? You know, this thing adds so much like sort of overhead, but I would encourage you to try building your app without Dagger as your choice of dependency injection. Don't use anything. You know, it is definitely as like Ralph is saying here, it is absolutely possible to build an app without using Dagger and achieve the same benefits where you have injections and shared like dependencies, all that is possible. But Dagger definitely, after a certain point, you'll start to notice that Dagger makes things incredibly easy. My biggest problem with Dagger was always like the construction bits, like the setup. Like if I could always jump into an app that already had Dagger solved, like life gets better, <laughs> you know, then because everywhere you have an activity, you just throw on an inject and boom, magically everything comes to you, right? Uh, it's only when you are the one who has to like set up your Dagger to set up the components, think through how you like, they talk to each other. That's where like the trouble with Dagger always like, or it starts to like bog people down, which is why Anvil is so great because it eases that specific process that you run into. I, I couldn't agree more um, with, with the suggestion to write uh, the dependent uh the code to in order to inject or provide dependencies manually uh i also would recommend everyone to set up dagger at least once in an application uh like you said that it's difficult but uh once you do everything manually it suddenly reveals all the hidden secrets that dagger is doing under the hood and the magic uh, of the framework is going away it w- also, like you said, if you start in a, working in a new code base that already uses Dagger, uh, everything a little bit feels like magic. Like you said, you can just add it in inject and inject new types and fields, and it automatically works for some reason. And But if you are the person who adds the setup and adds the necessary infrastructure code, it isn't magic at all because you have written the setup code and it's so suddenly becomes more obvious and easier to understand. So I would definitely recommend anyone to to set up Dagger once and suddenly it's easier to understand. And even at this point, some of the error messages make sense. <laughs> <laughs> true, true, true. I In the early days, I used to think it, it's much better, but like, you know how Rails as a service, like in the web service is full convention over like, con- uh, I think it's convention over configuration, right? So I, in the early days, I used to say like, oh my God, Dagger is just like that. You just throw in some things and then you trust Dagger to take care and it's all magic. But Dagger is much better because you can actually trace down like the paths, like you, it generates code that you can actually look at. You can look at the code, you can read the code. Granted, it's not going to be as clean as some of the code that you write manually, but it's still like traceable in many ways, right? And that, like, yeah, the beauty of Dagger is realized only when you do not have Dagger. When you have Dagger, it's very much like, you know, people usually uh, complain about Dagger. But when it's taken away from you, you're like, oh, my God, I didn't know all that happened. Like you said, right, you slap on and inject on like, you know, a class on its constructor and magically it's just created and then passed and like added to the graph. And yeah, some of that is bonkers, <laughs> you know, like having to do that manually it definitely re- reduces boilerplate to a huge extent. So... Uh, I know like I've been keeping you for some time, but I just want to touch a few quick points before like, you know, I let you go. Uh, There are like some aspects of Anvil that I also really like that I want to call out. Uh, The feature that I personally love a lot is the contributes binding annotation. I'm curious, was that something that just came out because like you were like, this would be easy if you just add it because it is by far my favorite feature, you know, it's because it's something that I do so common where I have an interface and I have an implementation and I want to just like, bind them i'm curious like was that something that you explicitly wrote because of how often you do it or was there a necessity to add that annotation how did you come about adding these ancillary features to an uh, anvil that's you you basically said it it we what we do is we look at these certain patterns that we have in our code base and we look at the especially the ones that feel like boilerplate and writing binds methods um was certainly one of those things that felt like boilerplate once you are already using Anvil. Um, that's why I, th- I tried to mention at the beginning uh, of our conversation that Dagger modules, not only can you write provider methods, but you can also say if you try to inject this specific type, then use this concrete implementation. And in our code base, um, the Dagger modules that we create in our uh, Gradle wiring modules, they usually only say, if you try to inject this type from the public module, from the API, 
then you get this concrete implementation from the uh, implementation module. And usually we just wrote implement uh, binding methods rather than provider methods in our Dagger modules. Um, and this became boilerplate because we, we, you had to write those binding methods and you, then you simply added the contributes to annotation and said contribute this Dagger module to the specific scope. Um, at this point, like I said, it was boilerplate and instead we created this contributes binding annotation that you add to your concrete implementation type where you say um, if someone tries to inject this, this uh, interface type then in for this specific scope, then use this concrete implementation. Um, and this avoids uh, creating the data module altogether and uh, actually Envil then will generate the binding method uh, in an, a separate data module and it will automatically include this data module in your specific scope. It's another convenience to remove boilerplate. And that makes perfect sense. It's just that aspect that you mentioned, the last bit was like the beauty in it because this is possible again. You said, like you said, with Dagger, you get the binds annotation is what this kind of replaces, but it doesn't just replace it; it makes it even better. Because even if you had the binds method, this is one of those few reasons why you would explicitly declare it and not have direct constructor injection. Because when you want to provide a concrete implementation, you have the binds method, and uh, you know you have the interface and then the implementation that you provide, but with this, the beauty is you you can avoid the module altogether. That's the bit that I really love because in my like interface, like in the class definition itself, I can add that same contributes. Uh, uh, it's called contributes binding, so it's similar to the contributes to scope. But when you say contributes binding, it also creates the sort of uh, yeah that whole module aspect, like you said. So it makes sense to me now because it actually creates a module in the background and it's a convenience thing. Uh, so. That I don't have to write the module anymore. Like it's just taken care of, especially for these cases where you have a bunch of like interfaces and concrete implementations that you want to supply. And I think especially for smaller code bases where you usually have only one concrete implementation for certain interfaces, um, it makes totally sense to use it because then they got fields like boilerplate that people often complain about. Um, when you only have one type that implements an interface and you want to inject this interface, you have to create a module. You have to create a binding method. You have to include this module in your Dagger component. That that is overhead, and um, Anvil basically replaces this by one simple annotation. Right, right, right. So yeah, that's why I want to call that. I I love this annotation. It's like you know, <laughs> it's the one that really makes things easy. Um, Running through quickly some of the other stuff, uh, there's also exclusions. And I imagine this is mostly if you have an existing gnarly setup, right? Like, where would I use exclusions? You know, uh, what's that feature? Because I haven't used it as much, but I'm curious what it actually does. Um, we we hope that you wouldn't need to use this feature. Um, but in reality, you will need to use it. So in it, I try to describe our module structure that we use a little bit with public and wiring. And um, in, in a very clean, an ideal world, um, you wouldn't need to use exclusions. Rather, your dependency graph for your application and your Gradle dependency graph decides uh, which implementations you bring in. But unfortunately, sometimes it happens if you don't have this uh, clear or this clean dependency graph and it's also not the case for us. We still have some legacy modules that don't follow this pattern. Uh, then it can happen uh, that you get duplicate bindings because, oh, for example, you contribute two modules, uh, Dega modules to the same scope that have the same binding. Um, then you run into this Dega error with duplicate bindings. But because Anvil automatically includes everything that is contributed, um, then uh, it is. Uh, you cannot avoid it. You cannot simply remove a Dagger module again because you want to automatically contribute it. And that's then the workaround for this scenario where you can say, oh, yes, I am aware that this module is automatically contributed to the scope, but I, when I build this uh, when I build this Dagger component, uh, please exclude this module and don't include it. Right, right. And this com the most common use case for this is also in testing, right? Where like, obviously, intentionally, you have a module, you do include that module, 
but you need to like for the testing purposes alone just remove this one module and that was a big problem when we moved from dagger one to two i think at least uh yeah it's been so long that i don't remember but that that was like that aspect where you're like no no i know i'm I'm testing i literally want just this one module please like somehow do this this helps a lot in that aspect i would imagine right yes yeah yes and the, the reason for this is that when you uh, compile your your test application which uh, includes all your instrumentation tests this test application also includes all the code of your main application and in in instrumentation tests, we often want to replace uh, real implementations by fakes. For example, the network stack. In instrumentation tests, we don't want to hit the real network because then our test would be flaky. Rather, we want to provide static responses. And um, what happens there is that, for example, you would inject your network service and in the main app, you want to use the real network service. But when you compile the instrumentation tests, uh, or your test APK, then you don't want to use the real network service, but rather a fake version. But because they are now suddenly part of the same compile unit, you run into this problem where you have two bindings and you only want to use one. Last question I want to ask is this, I'm sure people are going to want to know the answer to this. And I know you've answered this in your readme as well, but it's the obvious question, right? Uh, Google came out with something called Hilt which is also it sounds similar ish but uh yeah i'm going like i'm going to like pose that question cuz i'm 100% sure you're going to get this question if we don't answer it uh you know what's the difference between anvil and hilt and that is a very fair question um if you hilt is basically um an opinionated version of dagger for android uh before this google had dagger android which wasn't uh, the best, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, I'll say that out. <laughs> <laughs> it was a framework on top of Dagger uh, to make uh, dependency injection specifically on Android easier. And, and Hilt is very similar. And Hilt has a very, very similar feature to uh, uh, to Anvil where you can uh, contribute modules to a specific scope. And then also Dagger would uh, collect them all and include them in your Dagger component. Um, we... When we developed Anvil, uh, Hilt wasn't released yet. So when we published it, or when we tried to solve the problem for us, uh, we didn't have to option to use it. But also then Hilt is more opinionated in how you do your setup. I think they have default components that you must use. And this simply wouldn't work in a code base with the size of ours. We It would be very tedious to roll out Hilt um, and Anvil seems to be more generic in this regard. If you ask only for the specific feature to contribute modules uh, to specific components, um, then I, I would always uh, fall back on Anvil rather than Hilt. But on top of this, Hilt provides many other features. And if you use Hilt, then you really don't need to use um, Anvil and you can just rely on Hilt. And yeah, things would work similarly. Um, the other downside of it again is that it's an annotation processor. It must work in a Java code base um, and, and generates Java code. And it's something we also want to avoid now simply because we've seen the gains uh, of generating Kotlin code and avoiding KPT. Um, so yeah, we, we want to stick with them with plus. And I think that's a very fair summary. Thank you for like being transparent and honest about that. I, yeah, I like that approach. Um, and in many ways, it was the same thing because I remember Hilt in the alpha days, uh, I took a look. It's just like sometimes your apps, yeah, when you have like a really crazy app, the thought of like having to like clean up like all the way was really difficult. But with Anvil, it was almost like you slap Anvil in whatever, modify just a few things, and then you can slowly start to like uh, change things and clean it up. So you know, Hilt, uh, Anvil is a very incremental approach, which incremental approach to changing your Dago story, which is the aspect of Anvil that I definitely liked. But yeah, if you're starting a new application and you know you want to go all in with like Google's recommendations with how they have the app structured, Hilt, like it's nice to know that Hilt also has these features. Of course, like uh I think Anvil also sticks if if you have paid the devil uh, you know his dues and learned how to use Dagger 2 really well, then Anvil in many ways remains pretty close, right? Because that's always been my approach. I would rather 
I don't want to like make my dagger setup even more fancy. It's like fancy enough. Dagger already gives us like a lot of fancy stuff. So I want to keep it, you know, I I know this much knowledge of dagger. It's helped me. I, I don't want to learn more about dagger. Just keep it the same way. So anvil is just enough where you're like, okay, I'll just give you three more annotations and I'll make your life that much more easy. Yeah. Yes. And that, that's something we tried really hard to achieve, uh, which is a very small API surface. Uh, usually when you work with and the, you only need to use one or two annotations, which are the contributes to annotation and um, maybe the merge component, but merge component, you do the setup once. And then you usually you work with add contributes to or contributes binding, which you mentioned earlier. Those two annotations, uh, that's it. You, you, you rarely use anything else. Uh, and those are uh, the only annotations that you need. And then the other part was uh, having incremental rollout of Ender. You can you can start using Ender, you can set it up, and uh, you that's it. You you don't need to change much code. Uh, it, it still works the same way. And then you can start uh, slowly to add, uh, can, yeah, start slowly adding the contributes to or the contributes binding annotations. And um, yeah, and then start going from there. And then maybe transition existing code to end it, but it's not required. This was awesome. I, I know we, we went a little extended as is the case with like most uh, Dagger episodes, just to be able to cover like such a complex topic. Thank you so much, Ralph. Like you, you broke it down really well. And I feel walking away from this conversation, I understand so much more about Anvil and I feel like more confident about just like the nuances of how it's wired and like where it came from. Thank you so much for spending time today, you know, with us and like talking through these things. We really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, also, thank you. Uh, I'm very glad to hear this and uh, that and this helpful for you. And I, I, it is, like you said, a very complex topic. And uh, I hope uh, it's a little bit easier to, to understand now. Uh, I'll make sure to add like resources uh, and links in the show notes to some of the things we mentioned here. But is there anything else that you wanted to talk about? Like how, if folks have questions about Anvil, and they want to like ping you, what would be a good way to do that? The the best way to reach me probably would be on Twitter. Yes. Okay. And uh, I think on Twitter, you are V-R-A-L-L-E-V. I'll make sure to add that in the show notes as well, but that's your Twitter handle. Exactly. Yes. And uh, yeah, uh, any, if there's anything else, like definitely be like, that would be a good place to reach uh, Ralph. I know I will, if I have any questions and I will again. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for joining us in the show, Ralph. Again, we really appreciate it. And we will catch folks in our next episode. Thanks again, Ralph. Thank you so much, Karstik. That's it for the show, folks. Fragmented is hosted by Don Felker and me, Kaushik Gopal. We edit and produce all the episodes here on Fragmented. You can find more Fragmented episodes at fragmentedpodcast.com. Thanks for listening, and we will catch you in the next episode.